Don't forget, bring a friend day in just two weeks. And we want to, to pack this building, not, not to pat ourselves on the back or, or, or to do any such thing. But I saw a church that's having what they're calling today, bring a soul day. I like that idea. Uh, even better, really, than bring a friend day. I think that's a better twist on it. Really what we're wanting to do, to bring people to Jesus. And that's what it is all about. We encourage you, and we have postcards. Uh, in the back, the, the conservatives, flyers, reminders, and we encourage you to take some, to give them to individuals and to invite them to come and to hear the Word of God. We're set with meals. Uh, I appreciate the good response and good uh, effort you have already put forth in that. And I know that together, great things are going to happen. You know, there have been times in my life that great things weren't going to happen, and it was very, very obvious the great things weren't going to happen, that in fact, I was going to lose and lose big. When I was in the fifth grade, I had this big, bright idea that I was going to play intramural basketball. You know, being a Kentucky boy, I was going to play basketball. And there's a reason that I only played one season, and that's the only team sport I have ever played in my life. Mom and Dad to this day laugh about that season. They laugh about the free throws that I got to shoot. Didn't get close to the rim, but I did get to shoot some free throws. They laugh about the fact that I fouled a boy five, six, seven times before the ref finally had to stop and call me for a foul. It was not a pretty picture. But there are some serious times in life that it seemed that I was going to lose and lose big. You know, I don't know about in your life, I'm sure it's the same. But there have been times it seemed that sin was going to get the upper hand. There have been nights that I've lain awake over something I said or something I did. There have been times that I've been tormented night and day with temptation. And I'd say it's pretty much the same in your life. Five years ago, I had a very serious health scare. I don't know if you're familiar with Gillian Barre or not, but it Apparently, that's what happened to my body. I contracted, apparently, a virus. And while my body was fighting that virus, it decided to attack my nerve, nervous system. And over a period of time, my legs stopped working altogether. I could not really walk. I was on a walker. And doctors were baffled. They were mystified as to what was taking place. I remember we went to West Virginia University, to their medical system there. I remember lying on a table. And there was a young med student, he was doing some testing and sticking needles all in my legs to see why they weren't working, the sound and all of that. And I remember we went and got the doctor who was actually over him. And they came back and they're looking at these test results and they're thinking Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS. When you talk about terrifying, you know, that's very scary. I've recovered from that, obviously, as most people with Guillain-Barre, at least if they're given a chance, do. And I'm thankful for that. But I learned then to trust God in a big way. I'm sure that if you look at your life, there have been some very big struggles. Sometimes it seemed that the enemy was really going to get the upper hand. That he was really going to come to you and attack you. Maybe it's the fact that one morning you woke up and you looked over at your spouse and you thought, why on earth did I ever marry this person? You know, when I was dating, he or she was so fun, or he or she was so much this way. Not anymore. Whom did I really marry? Maybe it's the fact that your children have acted in ways that you thought your children would never act. Maybe it's been health. Maybe it's been that you yourself have acted and done things you thought you would never do. Ways you'd never act. And this morning, you're racked with guilt and shame. What do you do? What do you do when the enemy is tormenting you day and night and it seems as though there is no end? And when it seems as though there is no way out? In Exodus 14... The people of God find themselves in that situation. God has rescued them from Egypt in a big and mighty way. 
God has sent ten plagues upon the Egyptians. He owed their firstborn. Pharaoh says, get out of here. We don't want you around here anymore. They flee. But then Pharaoh changes his mind. He thinks, you know, these slaves I have, that, that's good slave labor. I'm going to go get them back. And here comes Pharaoh. The only problem is the Israelites are at the Red Sea. There is absolutely no place to go. No place to turn. What do you do? When you're in a place where there's nowhere to turn. Where there's nowhere to go. I'll tell you what happened with the Israelites. The Israelites learned a very important lesson. They learned that God is on your side. He wasn't on the side of the Egyptians. They weren't His people. The Israelites were His people. And God was on their side to bless them over and over. This morning we're going to go to Exodus 14. We want to learn that lesson too. To hear the Word of God, to hear that God is on our side and that God will fight for us. Go with me to Exodus 14, 13. The people are surrounded. See in front of them, Pharaoh behind them, all his army. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will never see again no more. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Brothers and sisters, what Moses says here does not make a lick of sense to me whatsoever. There is this great army coming up behind them. The world superpower. Do you see what he says? Do not be afraid. Well, let me tell you something. If I'm standing at a sea and Al Qaeda is behind me, I'm going to be afraid. Aren't you? Here come the North Koreans. Don't be afraid of them. The Russians a few years ago, here they come. They got their nukes, but don't be afraid of them. Do you realize that's what Moses is saying? Here comes the world superpower. Don't you be afraid. And then he says, stand still. Let me tell you something. If there's a superpower behind me, this fat boy could run. <laughs> okay? But Moses says, don't you do it. Stand still. Just wait. That doesn't make a lick of sense. Don't be afraid. Stand still. You know why it makes sense though, don't you? God is going to fight for them. There is no way on this earth you Israelites can fight. Moses cannot fight this army. He knows it. The Israelites know it. And what they have to learn is they cannot do it. But God can. Don't be afraid. Stand still. And you will see today the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you. These people who are troubling you, you shall see no more. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Moses, the Lord says, Why are you crying up to me? Don't you remember what I just did back in Egypt? Don't you remember that darkness? Don't you remember the frogs and the flies and the lice and the hail and the death of the firstborn? Don't you remember, Moses? Don't the people remember? You know, it almost seems to me as though God's somewhat exasperated. Where's your faith? You've seen already what I can do. Just give me a chance. I'm going to do it again. 
But that's what he tells them. But as you lift up your staff, the children of Israel are going to cross on dry ground. Dry ground. They're not going to cross on muddy uh, ground where you can tell the water's been. But the power of God is so great, these people are going to cross on dry ground. Now think about that. God is going to show that He has enough power not just to get His people through the sea. He's going to do it. But He's going to take them across on dry ground as though the water has never been there in the first place. And I indeed, verse 17, will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Pharaoh's not going to do too well. God says that. God is going to have the honor. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, not their gods, but I am. When I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. An angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of the Israelites. And thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light to by night to the other. So the one did not come near the other all that night. A line of demarcation. You understand the crossing the Red Sea is a line of demarcation of the people of God. Moses, uh, Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 10. And the people are baptized in the sea with Moses. Line of demarcation. But here, the angel of God is showing who are the people of God and who are not. He's separating them so that the Egyptians cannot come and harm his people. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went in the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall on them to their right and on their left. Can you imagine that faith? You know, there's a part of me that says, if I were in their shoes, I'd almost rather take my chances with the Egyptians than to go across that, that sea where the water's all around me. I hate water. I don't want to drown. And it's all around them. On their right and on their left. But yet they go forward in faith. And the Egyptians thought they could do it too, didn't they? Verse 23. The Egyptians pursued and went, in, went after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch, the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians, the pillar of cloud and fire, and it troubled the army of the Egyptians, and it took off their chariot wheels, so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came in the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. Pharaoh wants these slaves back. Pharaoh thinks, I can go in after them as well. God looks down from heaven. He sees what's taking place. God knows what's taking place, of course. As Moses writes here, the Lord looks down from heaven and he sees it. He troubles their chariots. Their chariots can't move in that ground. Uh, the New King James says their wheels come off. We don't know exactly what the Hebrew means there. But somehow their chariots become troubled. They can't move. And that water that was held back for the Israelites to cross, it comes back over them. And I love what Moses records here. Not so much as one of them remained. Not even one. 
You see, God was on their side. And God said, not one of them will live. And brother, let me tell you something. When God says it, that's pretty much the way it's going to be. You know that. And so when God said these Egyptians are not going to live, they're not going to do this, it did happen. Because God had said. But the children of Israel, verse 29, had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Can you imagine standing there and seeing all these dead bodies coming up on the seashore? Really? What a powerful reminder of the greatness and majesty, power of God. How that God had saved your people because God was on your side. Because God had decreed that He would save you, but He would not save the Egyptians. Thus, verse 31, Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and His servant Moses. What a powerful truth. How the Israelites were at the end. It was over. Egypt was going to come and if they did not take them as slaves, they were going to wipe them out. One of those two things was going to happen. Physically, there was no other option. But God stepped in. Skeptics of Scripture will point out something about this text. They will point out that in the ancient Near East, in the Near East to this day, winds will come and move some water. And in 24 hours you have dry land there because the wind pushes the water back. The ground dries up and you can cross it on dry ground. Scientifically that happens even today. But you understand... In those places, the water is so shallow, the Egyptians weren't going to drown. And so skeptics will say, see, this can happen. It's not scientifically possible. Well, that's kind of the point. Okay? It's not scientifically possible. It's God doing it. You know, that, that's what the text says. That's the whole point of it. The idea is that when God says, I'm going to save somebody, God's going to do it. And here, he said, I'm going to be with my people. I am on their side. And he was. And we know also that God is on our side as his people now. But what's that mean for us? You know, is it simply a fact that we come and we hear a good sermon on the cross and the Red Sea and we can go home and feel good about ourselves? I don't think so. I really don't. You know, as I read this narrative, there was something that strikes me about it as, as I read through there. The Israelites couldn't just stand there on the seashore. If they did, I don't care if the sea was, was parted or not, they were going to die or be taken captive. God gives them very strict instructions. These Israelites have some things they have to do. And I believe we also have some things to do. And what I want to suggest this morning is that when we're facing the enemy, when our back is against the wall, we do what the Israelites did. We do the exact same thing that they did because God was on their side. What do we need to do in the first place? You understand that what we have to do is we have to listen to God. Because God is on our side. We absolutely must listen to God. Moses listens to God. And God tells Moses two things here. One, God tells Moses 
precisely what he should do, what Moses should do. And B, God tells Moses exactly what he, that is God, is going to do. So, here's what happens. God says, okay Moses, you stretch out your staff, you do what I tell you to do, and I'm going to have honor. And so he tells him both what to do himself and what God is going to do. Yeah, I understand. We're thinking about God, listening to God, that, that God's not going to come in some audible voice and, and speak to us. He does it through Scripture. You know that. So, how do we need to hear God? We need to remember what God has said. In the first place, we need to remember what God has told us to do. Moses could not simply sit there. Moses had to stretch out his staff over the sea. The children of Israel had to cross the sea in order to get away from the Egyptians. We're going to think more about that in a moment, what we need to do. But also, we need to remember what God has told us He will do. It's not just that God gave Moses instructions and said, Moses, do this. He did. But then God says, here's what I'm going to do if you do this. And likewise, we need to remember the great promises of God. I love Romans 16, 20. Paul, writing to the Roman church, says the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Is that not a beautiful thought? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet your feet. And then we know Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. And there if you start in the middle of verse 5. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Standing there at the seashore, the Red Sea in front of you, Pharaoh's army behind you, it might have seemed that man could do a great deal of things to these Israelites. But God steps in and says, uh-uh, they're not going to. And you know too that man can do nothing to us. Oh, they can kill the body. You understand that. But not us. They can't get to us who we are. What can man do to me? He can harm the body. Not going to get me. The promise of God. Because God is on our side. We need to listen to God. Also, because God is on our side, we need to trust God. We need to trust God. I've alluded to it, but can you imagine how much faith it took to cross the Red Sea? Seriously. To go into that sea with that water all around you. Moses, what happens when that wind stops blowing? Moses, what happens when this water comes back? It took a lot of faith. But yet the Israelites crossed in faith and God rewarded them. Brothers and sisters, we need to trust in God. The people of God have always trusted God. I love the book of Job. I love that book. And one of my favorite statements is Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job erroneously believes that God is causing all his suffering. Read the book. Uh, Job believes this is all God's doing, that God's doing it to him. And with that mindset... What a great statement of faith Job 13, 15 is. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. 
Job knew where to put his confidence. He doesn't know that Satan went to God like, like we do and that Satan's tormenting him. He, he doesn't understand that. Don't know that he ever got that. But he knows this. That he can put his trust and faith in God. And that's where trust and faith needs to be. Not in man. Not in physicians. Not, not in anyone else but in God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Hebrews 11 is rich. Now verse 13. Thinking about great faith, we read of the patriarchs, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Not with their eyes, brethren. They didn't see it physically. They trusted God. They knew God said, I'm going to do this. And that was as good as done. Same thing with Jesus in Bible class this morning. God decreed it was as good as done. These patriarchs could die in faith, seeing the promises by faith. Because they knew God's word was golden. And knew that God would do precisely what God said to do. He would do. How then do we get that faith? How, how do we really trust God? I think there are three steps in trusting God. There are three we're going to talk about this morning. The first is this. We can remember how God dealt with biblical characters. We can remember His faithfulness, His power, and biblical characters were, trusted, were, were tested. Think about Daniel there in the lion's den. How that Daniel continued to pray every day even though he'd been warned not to. How that King Darius took Daniel and threw him into a den of lions. How that God came and shut their mouths. You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who said, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not bow down to your golden image. Nebuchadnezzar has that furnace turned up way harder than usual. Even the men throwing the men die. But they're walking around and there's an angel in there. You think of Abraham. Who when he was an old man, because of the promise of God... God gave him a son. You think about Golgotha and how the devil had won. The son of God was dead. But God said that is not the last word and raised Jesus from the dead. Now, brethren, if that won't cause you to trust in God, I don't know what will. God has always blessed His people. And God continues to do so Number two, the way that we learn to trust God. Look back at your own life. How has God blessed you? Have you not been at the breaking point at times? Has it not been figuratively you're at the Red Sea and the army is behind you? And haven't there been times God's opened that up and allowed you to cross on dry ground? And if God's done it in the past, don't you think He'll do it again? That's the God we serve. And then, we pray. We pray. You see, there is nothing, nothing in this world that says, I have trust in God more than praying. There is nothing that says, I trust God more than throwing my hands up getting on my knees and letting Him deal with it. That says, I put my confidence in Him. Are you trusting God this morning? Really and truly. Final thing that the Israelites did. Because God's on our side. We need to obey God. 
In this morning's text, there are commands to be obeyed. Moses has to stretch out his staff over the Red Sea. The Israelites have to cross the command of God. God has told them what to do. There are commands. They obeyed in spite of big odds. And brothers and sisters, we need to obey in spite of big odds. You know, I've dealt with people before that, that when the going really got tough, they thought God didn't care if they obeyed or not. You know, that, that's an excuse. Because I've got this in my life or that in my life. I don't have to do what God says. You know, I've had this hard life, so God's going to overlook this. When the going gets tough, we need to obey God all the more. That's all the more reason to do what God says. Not just when it's easy, but when it's hard and when it's costly. Because God values obedience to His Word. Saul goes against the Amalekites. He takes spoil that God had told him not to take. Samuel meets him as he's going back home. And Samuel says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's this burning of the cattle I hear? What, what, what's going on? You remember what Saul said? Oh, I, I'm going to offer these in sacrifice to God. God's going to be so happy with me. Do you remember what the word of the Lord through Samuel was? Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel 15, 22. God, through Samuel the prophet, says, Saul, I wanted you to obey me above everything else. You do what I say. And brethren, can we as the people of God do anything less than to obey the word of the Lord? Acts 5, 29. Oh, we quote this in different contexts all the time, talking about laws of the land. But notice what Peter and John say very, very carefully. Acts 5, 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. I wish I knew why the word ought was there. It doesn't belong there. In Greek, the word's really stronger than that, you see. The word is day, it means must. Have to. No choice. What well, Peter and John really say, leave off that rather than men for a moment. What they really say to the Sanhedrin, we must obey God. And brethren, I believe that's our obligation. We must obey God. The Israelites do so at the Red Sea. And because they obey God at the Red Sea, God blesses them in a big way. And if we want the blessings of God, my brethren, we have to obey. James 1 says that. The one who is blessed in James 1, about verse 25, is the one who does what God says. Is God blessing you this morning? Is God blessing you as His child because you're obedient to His Word? Do you need to come this morning and receive the great blessings of God to receive salvation from sin because you turn from sin, you, you, you repent of your sin, and you're baptized into Jesus to have your sins remitted? Be a child of God and need the prayers of this good church that God might bless you. That we together can help you deal with sin and that God can richly bless you in your life. If you need to come this morning, would you come right now as we stand singing?